this, okay, um, chairing this final um, online seminar, um, which the Raymond Williams Society has organised to mark Williams' centenary um, year. And these three events are sort of prefiguring and will culminate in uh, an in-person conference to be held in Manchester in uh, April next year, 22nd, 23rd April. There's more information about the conference on our website, please check it out. But we've got great keynotes, we've got R Rihanna Jones, Daniel G. Williams. We've got Townsend Theatre Productions who are gonna be staging for us their new play, uh, which is just in rehearsal at the moment about the Upper Clyde Shipbuilders work in 1971, 72. And at the playwright Neil Gore is gonna be coming um, to the conference to talk about the process of writing the play. Um, and the, 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 there's a call for papers out there, you'll have seen it, it's on the website. Uh, um, the, the date is, the, the deadline is sort of coming up, I think, at mid-December, so um, please do submit uh, proposals for papers and, and panels. Uh, and please do, you know, write to us if you've got particular things you'd like to see us do in, in that two-day conference space, you know, we're really open to suggestions. Um, but tonight we're here to mark the publication of an exciting new edited collection, Raymond Williams at 100, edited by Paul Stasi, um, published in April uh, this year. Uh, it's a really, it's a really great collection and it's great to see it, you know, it's great to see a book like this coming out in the centenary year. Um, just give a quick sort of overview of what the book does. I mean, it, it's, it comprises eight chapters, basically split into two halves. Uh, the first four chapters unpack and reflect upon key concepts in Williams's work, mediation, um, in a chapter by Anna Kornbler, uh, long politics, Mark Allison, utopia, Matthias Nilgis, and structure of feeling, feeling Thomas A. Lachlan. So, so the first half of the book is unpacking those concepts. And the second half is called Noble Communities, and it develops reading of Williams' work across uh, various and in some cases, you know, new contexts and conjunctures, you know, places where William's work hasn't really been applied before, I think. Uh, the neoliberal university in a chapter by Daniel, Daniel Hartley, who was with us for our last, last online, online seminar, of course. Realism and sentimentality in the novel, in particular, and that is Roy, Ministry of Unhappiness, Paul's uh, excellent chapter. Um, at the, at the networks of African literary production, uh, Madhu's um, chapter, and television, including The Wire by Daniel uh, Warden. It's a, it's a really carefully curated uh, collection, um, constantly angled at the question, I think, of, of why we should read Williams now, you know, why we should care about Williams' work now. And it, it ranges really impressively, impressively and authoritatively across the full range of Williams' work. And, I, you know, it succeeds where a lot of editors edited collections don't succeed in that it is much greater uh, than the sum of its parts. So it's, it's, it's lovely tonight to have um, three contributors from the book um, with us, including Paul, the editor. Um, so we're going to have three papers based around the chapters in those respective chapters um, from these contributors. Um, and, and we'll, so we'll start off uh, with Paul, um, Paul Stasi, who's the editor of the book teaches 20th century Anglophone literature at the University at Albany, where he is uh, an associate professor. He's the author of Modernism, Imperialism and the Historical Sense, 2012. The co-author, co-editor with Kenneth O'Brien, Western, Edward and the End of American Empire, 2013. And the co-editor with Josephine Park of Ezra Pound in the present USA on Pound's Contemporaneity, 2016. So we'll take all the papers back to back and we'll have questions at the end. So uh, over to you, Paul, and, and welcome. Great, thanks so much. Um, thanks, Ben, and thanks to Phil O'Brien and the Raymond Williams Society for having us, and thanks to Anna and Madhu for being here. Um, this was a really fun project to, uh, to put together. Um, it was a nice time to really kind of dive deeply into Williams's work and to meet others who were doing the same, so it was great. Um, I'm going to sort of read a, a section of my chapter um, uh, on Williams and Ardnati Roy. Uh, what interested me in the full piece was the homology between Roy's novel, 
defined by its totalizing attempt to depict Indian social reality alongside a strong defense of the individuals this brutal world damages, and Williams's theory of realism, partly as a response to the well-known charge that Williams gave Empire short shrift in his work. So I was interested in seeing what Williams can tell us about a post-colonial novel that might seem initially out of his sort of purview. I was less interested in litigating this claim at the level of content, though there are notable places where he does discuss Empire, particularly in his later writings on Wales, as Daniel Williams has shown pretty authoritatively. Then in thinking about how Williams' formal reading of the novel might be transported to a new context. I I'm happy to talk about that later, but given that I don't want to talk forever, I thought I would just kind of outline here what I think is unique, compelling about Williams's um, underappreciated contribution to the theory of the novel. So to begin, I want to look at Williams's understanding of the novel, which in contrast to most theories of the novel, which tend to depend on the construction of an individualized subject, turns on what Williams called knowable communities. Looking back at a formative period in English fiction, quote, those 20 months in 1847 and 1848 in which these novels were published, Dombey and Son, Wuthering Heights, Vanity Fair, Jane Eyre, Mary Barton, Tancred, Town and Country, The Tenant of Wildfield Hall, Williams finds one central element, quote, the exploration and substance of the substance and meaning of community. And this is from the book on the English novel. Uh, this meaning takes shape in relation to individual lives in a process described perhaps most clearly in the long revolution. Uh, this is a bit of a quote here. When I think of the realist tradition in fiction, the balance involved is perhaps the most important thing about it. It offers a valuing of a whole way of life, a society that is larger than any of the individuals composing it. And at the same time, it values the creation of human beings who, while belonging to and affected by and helping define this way of life, are also, in their own terms, absolute ends in themselves. Neither element, neither the society nor the individual, is there as a priority. The society is not a background against which the personal relationships are studied, nor are the individuals merely illustrations of aspects of the way of life." End quote. So many key motifs of Williams's thought are present in this passage. The famous definition of culture as a whole way of life is here the very thing the realist novel addresses, as it takes up the structural position characteristic of culture as a discourse from which it can examine and critique the world out of which it emerges. We also observe the careful balance between the individual understood as an end in itself and the shaping power of a social order. The entire passage turns on this relationship between individual instance and society, a relation that Williams refuses to reduce to one term or the other. The individual is simultaneously an end in itself while also at the same time an instance of the larger social whole. The distinctiveness of this account is best seen by comparing it to, to what initially might seem like similar discussions by George Lukács and Franco Moretti, each of whom also sees the novel as fundamentally constituted by the relation between individual characters and social destiny. For the mature Lukács, the, the historical novel, his privileged instance of the genre, quote, portrays the struggles and antagonisms of history by means of characters who in their psychology and destiny always represent social trends and historical forces, end quote. The novel humanizes history, but it does so through characters that are primarily vehicles for the historical structures they help to convey. Moretti, for his part, outlines in The Way of the World a theory of the buildings roman, which he calls the symbolic form of modernity as a perpetual struggle between freedom and determination. If modernity's essence is youth, its intrinsically boundless dynamism needs to be harnessed for socially acceptable ends. Two formal principles emerge with which Moretti names classification and transformation. The first emphasizes stability. In it, quote, youth is subordinated to the idea of maturity. The second emphasizes transformation, where, quote, youth cannot or does want not want to give way to maturity. In the first instance, we have novels like Jane Eyre, which subordinates its heroine to the imperatives of a social order. In the latter are novels like The Red and the Black, where the hero chooses death over accommodation to the social order. But what's important to see is that in each case, society triumphs. The ideological function of the buildings roman is to make this triumph palatable. If the building roman is the most contradictory of modern symbolic forms, that is because, quote, in our world, socialization itself consists, first of all, in the interiorization of contradiction, end quote. 
Despite this emphasis on contradiction, Moretti's notion of the ideological function of the Bildungsroman is relatively prescriptive. Sociality is, in these novels, the realm of unfreedom towards which the individual must bend. It will surprise no one, of course, to discover that where Moretti reads ideology, Williams finds agency. Indeed, the fundamental emphasis of Williams's interest in culture was always towards the creation of common meanings. From his partial recuperation of conservative thinkers in culture and society, to his assertion that culture is ordinary, to his insistence on the effaced labor constitutive of country house poems, Williams provided a lifelong lesson in the interested reading of cultural objects, one guided by his view that, quote, the arts and learning are in a real sense a national inheritance, which is or should be available to everyone. Culture, that is to say, was a field of struggle, and if William's early rendering of it in culture and society seemed, as E.P. Thompson famously argued, to leave out the conflict, it's easy enough to see his later readings of cultural objects and texts such as the country and the city as putting it back in. This is one way of returning individualized forms of seeing to their basis in communal forms of understanding. Against Lukács, then, Williams offers a defense of the individual as something other than a social type. Against Moretti, he reads the social as something other than ideological conscription. Each side of the equation emerges as the site of both freedom and determination. So we can use these ideas to examine Williams' related, if contrasting, readings of Austin and Dickens. Williams' reading of Austin starts with the rural community, taken as, quote, the epitome of direct relationships in contrast to the unknowability of urban space. In Austin, we find what seems, quote, a single tradition, that of the cultivated rural gentry, living in a, quote, simple traditional setting in fictions concerned with, quote, purely personal relationships divorced from the decisive historical events of Austin's time. This view, however, is immediately overturned as Williams outlines the shifting fortunes of nearly every major character in each of Austin's novels. It must be clear, Williams concludes, that it is no single settled society it is an active, complicated, sharply speculative process of inherited and newly enclosing, enclosing and engrossing estates, of fortunes from trade and colonial and military profit being converted into houses and property and social position. The paradox of Jane Austen, then, is the achievement of a unity of tone, this is William Still, of a settled and remarkably confident way of seeing and judging in this chronicle of confusion and change. This tone, Williams suggests, represents, quote, the development of an everyday uncompromising morality, which is, in effect, separable from its social basis. The force of Austin's carefully balanced appraisals, sense and sensibility, pride and prejudice, distracts us from the insecurity that is everywhere in her plots. Williams here deftly combines something very basic, a reading of plot detail that will be familiar to all readers of Austen, and yet somehow at the same time striking, since never organized in quite this fashion before. With a reading not only of form, taking tone to be part of a, the formal element of fiction, but also of the way form separates itself out from plot, creating a kind of autonomous moral realm of evaluation that is intimately tied to Austen's class background, and yet appears separable from these origins. It is, in other words, a description of the separation of consciousness from material activity characteristic of Austen's style, given in an analysis that refuses such separations. So there are two aspects of this reading that I find particularly noteworthy. The first is the way the social reality brought to bear on Austen's novel is intrinsic to the form itself. This is why Williams manages to tell us a new point about Austen as if it were something we already knew. So aptly does it describe our basic experience of reading the text that description is also immediately analysis. There is, as Williams once said, no natural seeing. My second point is related, for if Austen on the one hand betrays exactly the kind of class prejudices we might expect of a particular location in the social order, Williams does not really take her to task for this. It would be easy enough, in other words, to rewrite the entire passage as unmasking, the construction of, of an autonomous aesthetic that ignores social conditions in the service of a middle-class ethos that pretends to be universal. But Williams isn't really interested in unmasking Austen. His point is primarily not a demystifying one. Rather, the particular insight Austen offers is the kind of insight available to a person of her social class at a particular moment in English history. To ask anything other of Austen is to misunderstand the determining power of historical ground, 
What else could she do but observe with precision the social world visible from her particular vantage point? Williams does something here that is remarkably different or dif <laughs> difficult. He historicizes an aesthetic form while simultaneously taking it seriously as a form of insight. Historicization, in other words, need not be the unmasking of the aesthetic, but rather might be the very way in which we can see whatever purchase it might have on the world it describes. The same virtues are evident in his argument about Dickens, who is clearly along with Hardy and perhaps Lawrence at the core of Williams's literary affections. Williams's chapter operates as a strong defense of those elements of Dickens for which he was often criticized. Indeed, if Austen's class restrictions become the precise measure of her insight into a shifting social reality, here Dickens's flat characters and sentimental solutions to social problems become his defining strengths. Dickens's work, Williams summarizes, is defined by, quote, arbitrary coincidences, sudden revelations and changes of heart. He offers not the details of psychological process, but the finished articles, the social and psychological products. It might seem strange to find Williams describing Dickens as turning process into product. This would be something that he would typically criticize, but he immediately shifts the blame to a reified society. For Dickens gives us, quote, a way of seeing men and women that belongs to the street. The decisive movement is a hurrying, seemingly random passing of men and women, each heard in some fixed phrase. If Dickens's characters, quote, speak or act past each other, it's because each is intent above all on defining through his words his own identity and reality, a desire that is created by the shifting social order in which they exist. Here we come to the core of Dickens's vision, which Williams describes in a variety of ways, each of which tells us something central about the relationship between lived reality and determining social conditions. Dickens describes the city as, quote, at once a social fact and a human landscape. Dramatizing a moral world in physical terms, he gives us a social condition seen at a level where it's also a human condition. Note how, here how this is basically the exact inverse of what Austin accomplished. There, morality removed itself from the social. Here, it is embedded within it. What Dickens is able to show us through his style, his form, or what Williams consistently calls his ways of seeing is the autonomy of that second nature we have created which then acts as a force outside of our control, a force as destructive and creative as the railroad in Dombey and Son seen first as an earthquake whose fiery eruptions lead to dire disorder, followed by crowds of people and mountains of goods producing a fermentation in the place that was always in action. This process is almost evolutionary. Capitalism abhors a vacuum, and Williams nicely shows how the pride of power is felt in the language. Dickens sees, in other words, the dialectical nature of capitalist development, its creative destruction. He shows us this, and he embodies it in his form, in those very stylistic tics, caricature, exhortation, overstatement, and simplification for which he was so often taken to task. Sentiment, too, is one of Dickens's supposed failings, a quality anathema to that, quote, other kind of novel preferred by the educated elite. Revaluing sentiment for Williams serves a class purpose in two specific ways, as a critique of educated elites and their distaste for what the people enjoy. And of course, this has a sort of leave us in the background of the whole thing, the great tradition, et cetera. But more importantly, as a critique of the capitalist class and its destruction of all human values, quote, to see a change of heart and a change of institutions as alternatives, Williams writes, is all ready to ratify an alienated society, end quote. Thus, if Dickens too often seems, quote, to produce virtue almost magically from the same conditions which in others bred vice, unquote, we need not believe in the strict veracity of these moments to realize that they are nevertheless, quote, the kind of miracle that happens, the flowering of love or energy which is inexplicable by the ways of describing people to which we have got used, end quote. Williams continues, this is a long quote, there is no reason that is to say for love or innocence except that almost obliterated by this general condition, there is humanity. The exclusion of the human, which we can see operating in a describable system is not after all absolute or would make no sense to call what is alienated human. There would otherwise be nothing to alienate. The inexplicable quality of the indestructible innocence of the miraculously intervening goodness on which Dickens so much depends and which has been casually written off as sentimentality is genuine because it is inexplicable, 
What is inexplicable, ap or what is explicable, sorry, after all, is the system, which consciously or unconsciously has been made. To believe that a human spirit exists ultimately more powerful than even this system is an act of faith, but an act of faith in ourselves." End quote. It is, of course, possible to dismiss these lines as themselves sentimental. Many have done so and placed them alongside Williams's repeated invocations of his working class family, seeing both as nostalgic or romantic. But I think this is wrong. These moments cut to the core of Williams's entire enterprise, which is to rescue genuine human connection from a system bent on destroying and commodifying it, a system that reduces lived experience to a set of reified formal relations. Reification, alienation, formalist reading stripped of content, human interactions absent of connection or warmth, the relative enclosure of categories of thought, the quote, extraordinary decision to call certain things culture and then separate them as with a park wall from ordinary people and ordinary work. These are all habits of thought Williams spent a lifetime trying to overturn. In the context of the English novel, it produces a reading of fiction that not only emphasizes community, but that methodologically suggests not only that formalist, and historicist readings need not be opposed, but rather more forcefully illustrates how the two only make sense when combined with one another. The dialectic of form and history, that is to say, is another version of the dialectic of individual and community. Each only exists in relation to the other. Thanks. That was great, Paul. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, let's move on now to um, Madhu, who's going to be talking ab about her chapter uh, on Look at a Feeling Late Capitalism and, and the Making of African Literature. Um, Madhu is um, a professor of Af African World and Contemporary Literature at the University of Bristol. She is the author of Contemporary African Literature in English Global Locations Post Colonial Identification 2014. Writing Spatiality in West Africa, Colonial Legacies in the Anglophone Francophone Novel, 2018, and the Contingent Canons, African Literature and the Politics of Location, 2018. And she is currently working on a project around literary activism in 21st century Africa. So it's great to have her here tonight to talk about her chapter. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ben. Thanks to Phil. Thanks to all the organizers. And thanks to Paul as well for inviting me to be part of this edited collection. Um, which I think is actually a really successful edited collection. And I would also say for me personally, writing my chapter felt like a real privilege because it was an opportunity to be very self-indulgent, returning to reading as much of Raymond Williams as I could and really thinking about what that meant for my work. Um, so my chapter, as you heard, is one that's thinking about what a return to the work of Raymond Williams might offer world literary studies and its various ecologies. And I used African literature not to say that it's something exceptional, but as a kind of test case or limit case for what it might mean to think through Williams when we think about world literature. And my impetus for this particular chapter came from two places, really. And one of those places is the fact that in world literary studies and African literary studies, it's extremely rare to see references to Williams scholarship despite the fact that many of his keywords and terms resound throughout the body of work produced by scholars, particularly the idea of structures of feeling, but you very rarely see people directly engage with Williams's thought. And, you know, I think there are reasons for this, and Paul kind of gestured to them in his paper, and some of these might be the fact that Williams never explicitly really discusses empire, some of them might be this thought that it's perhaps overdated, um, these kinds of questions. But the other, the other reason that I was really interested in doing this, this project and that kind of sparked my interest in my chapter was I, I more and more as I thought about it realized that Williams's work might actually help me solve a puzzle that I've been puzzling over for about six or seven years. So to explain this, I have to tell you a little bit about my own work. So my work is on African literature and literary studies. And it's primarily um, practice-based and field-based. Um, my primary ethos is research as practice. By this, I mean, I work primarily co-laboring, co-producing with different kinds of literary activists, producers, writers, editors, so on and so forth, in specific sites on the African continent um, in English and in French. So this means that I spend a lot of my time, except for when we're in a global pandemic, <laughs> 
on the African continent being an engaged part of reading cultures there. And the thing that I've really noticed is how engaged and expansive reading cultures are. So you can go to a festival like the Afe Festival, for example, and you know the crowds are packed. Or in 2019, I went to the Hargeza International Book Festival in Somaliland. And you know, all we ever see on the Western media about Somaliland is, ooh, Somaliland is next to Somalia, there's pirates. But what I really was struck by were these sold out auditoriums filled with ordinary people who were engaging deeply with literature and culture, not as a bolt on, not as a trend, but as something that was deeply intrinsic to their understanding of the social and sociality. So where does Williams come into this? Well, for me, there's always been this disjuncture between the scholarship around African literature and its lived realities. So what I'm basically trying to say is, you know, there are these kinds of notions that circulate now as received wisdom in the context of world literary production and African literary production, that for instance, there are no reading publics in Africa. There are no reading cultures in Africa. Literature in an African context is a residual form. It's purely elitist. It's estranged from real life and ordinary people. These things are now kind of common knowledge. And yet when I read the sort of scholarship, which is broadly written by scholars based on the world of the North, it has very little resonance for my lived experience as somebody who spends a lot of time on the continent in different contexts involved in literary culture. So what I'm gonna do in this talk is I'm gonna read some parts of my essay because this is what my essay is exploring. It's thinking about how thinking about Williams's work and particularly concepts like structures of feeling can help us understand where this disjuncture comes from, but it can also help us kind of put things back together and kind of try to rectify some of the dynamics of visibility that have, in my view, impeded scholastic and scholarly and academic understanding of world literary ecologies. So my overarching argument is a genuine return to Williams's work can enable a more engaged, robust, and accurate understanding of world literary production. So I'm gonna read some bits and pieces. I'm gonna editorialize a bit. If it sounds disjointed, it's because it is, because it was a 9,000 word chapter that I'm now gonna talk about in about eight minutes. So over the last seven years of intensive field-based research in different African contexts, I have witnessed the vitality of lived literary cultures in places as varied as Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, Kampala, Uganda, Yaoundé, Cameroon, Cape Town, South Africa, or elsewhere. All of these places demonstrate firsthand the ways in which the expression of literary culture is entangled within a series of complex social, economic, and political relations, which extend beyond neat categorizations of the literary field, global literary market, or world republic of letters, three key words that we see resounding in world literary studies. And yet these very formations remain far less visible in any world literary topography or ecology than the relatively small body of work that circulates across uh, transnationally today under the name of the new African novel or global African literatures. Despite the myriad connections between live living literary cultures on the African continent and the set of commodities which represent African literature in the global marketplace. One of the central preoccupations of my essay in this collection then was to think about the mechanisms through which this feeding occurs and how the methods for cultural studies proposed by Raymond Williams might offer one path for reconnecting what seemed to be disparate modes of cultural production. So early in the pages of The Long Revolution, Williams, in a seemingly obvious statement, provides the reader with a diagnosis of the central challenge facing cultural studies. He writes, quote, it is only in our own time and place that we can expect to know in any substantial way the general organization of a society. We can learn a great deal of the life of other places and times, but certain elements will always be irrecoverable. This further common element, he continues, which is neither the social character nor the pattern of culture, but as it were, the actual experience through which these were lived will forever elude the critic. So end quote. At the same time, within the boundaries of culture, it leaves its perceptible traces as that which Raymond Williams once termed as a structure of feeling. And so I'm gonna editorialize here. One of the things I found really interesting about working on this paper is 
everybody uses the phrase structure of feeling, but very few people have actually read Raymond Williams' definition of it. People use it as a metaphor, they use it as a shorthand, they use it as a kind of lazy way to, you know, elide over a lot of complexity. So I found it really instructive for my own work to return to his actual definition. And I'm going to read it to you now, and I'm going to apologize. If there are people with accessibility needs, I'd be very happy for you to raise your hand right now because I do have a PowerPoint that has the long quotes on it that I could put up. I hesitate to screen share because I think it's better on Zoom to see the person talking in their slides, but I'm very happy to do that. Or you can just send me a DM in chat and I'll send it to you that way as well, because I think it's important that we remember accessibility needs. So I'm about to read a very long quotation. So in The Long Revolution, Raymond Williams defines the concept of the structure of feeling. He writes, it is as firm and definite as structure suggests. Yet it operates in the most delicate and least tangible parts of our activity. In one sense, the structure of feeling is the culture of a period. It's the particular living result of all the elements in the general organization. And it is in this respect that the arts of a period, taking these to include characteristic approaches and tones and argument, are of major importance. For here, if anywhere, this characteristic is likely to be expressed, often not consciously, but by the fact that here, in the only examples we have of recorded communication that outlives its bearers, the actual living sense, the deep community that makes the communication possible is naturally drawn upon. So emphasized in this concept is this idea that through a kind of sense of, of reading, through a kind of cultural studies, we might begin to identify the relations from which structures of feeling their lack of visibility and the difficulty inherent in excavating their full sense are produced as one of the primary drivers of the seeming incompatibility of African literary critical scholarship on the one hand and African literary cultural production as experienced on the others. Much of the recent scholarship on African literature and the global literary marketplace has followed the models of world literary production and consecration outlined in Pierre Bourdieu's notion of the field of cultural production and its extension into the World Republic of Letters by Pascal Casanova. Significant in this work is the notion of the field of cultural production as a quote, field of struggles defined by its quote, position takings or quote, literary and artistic positioning. For Bourdieu, the field of cultural production operates largely as a series of discrete national traditions which shift over time. In Casanova's formulation of world literary space, it is a quote, relatively unified space characterized by the opposition between great national literary spaces, which are also the oldest and best endowed and those literary spaces that have become more recently appeared and are poor by comparison. For Casanova, this conceptualization of a kind of flat horizontal world republic of letters with a center and periphery offers a model for conceptualizing the larger iterative processes through which literary works move across locations endowed with differing levels of prestige and influence. And I think thinking about Paul's talk, you can see some of the ways in which like Moretti's conception of world literature and Casanova's conception of the world republic of letters sort of speak to each other in varying ways. It is through this process that it becomes quote, possible to evaluate and recognize the quality of a work or to the contrary to dismiss, dismiss a work as an anachronism or to label it provincial with the ultimate effect of creating a universal artistic clock what Pascal Casanova calls Greenwich Meridian time or a kind of literary equivalent by which writers must regulate their work if they wish to attain legitimacy. In the context of African literature, a relatively small selection of texts and authors have been identified as attaining this particular mode of legitimacy, entering global literary markets and the fields of the global North and thereby acquiring world literary prestige. So my interest in this detour through the world literary system is less to assess the validity of these claims about which I actually have quite a lot to say, but not in this particular space, and more to consider what they leave out and what 
replacing William's own work in dialogue with these models might enable to emerge. So in The Long Revolution, Williams writes that, quote, we tend to underestimate the extent to which the cultural tradition is not only a selection, but also an interpretation. We see most past work through our own experience without even making the effort to see it in something like its original terms. What analysis can do is not so much to reverse this, returning a work to its period, as to make the interpretation conscious by showing historical alternatives to relate the interpretation to the particular contemporary values on which it rests, and by exploring the real patterns of the work that confront us with the real nature of the choices we are making. So taken not simply as a given, but as an interpretive act, the dominant tradition, what I'm here loosely consolidating under the category of global African literatures or the new African novel, is simply one subset amongst others whose own position in terms of its visibility might itself efface the larger complex totality from which it is selected. In the context of world literary production, it takes its most obvious contemporary guise, as Williams observes, as, quote, the fantastic projections of a few centers. In all of its force, the monolith of the selective tradition presents itself as a given to the detriment of our ability as scholars to perceive its internal relations as well as its external relations to the larger ecology from which it is derived and the alternative visions encoded therein. Once we perceive the selection of a cultural tradition as itself an interpretive act, fundamentally entangled with the larger values, preoccupations, and elements of the society, the so-called autonomy of the literary field or world republic of letters is called into question as it should be. Rather than view literature or culture as operating, as Bourdieu might have it, as a homology to the economic and social fields, it becomes directly intertwined through a multifaceted network of relations, some more obvious than others, which together produce the mechanisms of selection through which a tradition is formed. So in my essay, I tried to heed William's observation, which he wrote about in The Long Revolution, that, quote, it is with the discovery of patterns of characteristic kind that any useful cultural analysis begins. And it's with the relationships between these patterns and correspondences, hitherto separately considered activities, that sometimes again reveal discontinuities of an unexpected kind that a general cultural analysis is concerned. So in the essay, I think about recent novels that have attained the kind of status of new African novels. So texts like um, Chimamanga Adichie's Americana, Yajasi's Homecoming, Mbolo Mbue's Behold the Dreamers, Taye Selassie's Ghana Must Go, Teju Sit Cole's Open City, and several others to kind of think about what sorts of patterns can we see emerging if we look at this as a body of textual scholarship. If we see these as key texts participating in the dominant tradition of the global African novel, what can we discern? Mm -hmm. So examining these texts together, we can, observe, we can observe a number of tendencies which offer evidence of a deeper structure of feeling underlying their selection and status as world literary texts consecrated by the World Republic of Letters. Chief amongst these are patterns of form, patterns of theme, and patterns of style. So in my essay, I go through some of these in much greater detail, but like just to give you an overview of some of the things we can see is adherence to a broadly realist tradition, an emphasis on the individual, a foregrounding of the affective rather than the political, a preoccupation with concepts of return, migration, and diaspora, and a tendency towards fragmentary narrative forms, which privilege multiple focalizers and perspectives and practice a depoliticized version of what Neil Smith, the human geographer, calls scale jumping. So in all of these, I think very seriously about what Williams reminds us in Towards 2000. And I just want to take this opportunity to give a plug for this little book, Towards 2000, which I think is one of the least read works by Raymond Williams, but I actually think one of his absolute best. So in this book, he revisits the long revolution and updates it. And the things that he says are incredibly interesting. And I think give us a lot of ways to think about how to apply his work to different eras and how to kind of nuance some of the ideas. So in Tours 2000, Raymond Williams writes that forms which still claim the status of minority art have by now become routine diversions and confirmations of paranational commodity exchange. 
with which indeed they have many structural identities. Elsewhere in the sociology of culture, Williams notes how, quote, formal innovation is a true and integral element of the changes in a social formation themselves. An articulation by technical discovery of changes in consciousness which are themselves forms of consciousness of change. Within the category then of African literature or the global African novel, what appears as a specifically constituted cultural form, that which I'm referring to as the new African novel, whose own structural assimilation of the precepts of neoliberalization stands as neither cause nor effect, but a manifestation of their entangled amplification in the 21st century. So Williams notes the ways in which the dominant institutions of culture create a paralysis so that attempts to shift their parameters, to do something new, to think differently, to be different, so on and so forth, can only ever become more entrenched and more appropriated into the already existing hierarchy of domination. He writes, and this is a very, very long quote, I'm also trying to simultaneously send it to the people who have asked for uh, the quotes and text form, so please do bear with me. I'm still not very good at all of this hybrid stuff. Right, so he says, there is a continuing sense of deadlock and much of the experience generated within it seems sterile. This is because the terms of mobility thus conceived are hopelessly limited. The combination of individual mobility with the stability of, in of institutions and ways of thinking uh, the combination of individual mobility with the stability of institutions and ways of thinking leads to this deadlock inevitably. And the experience of artists and intellectuals is then particularly misleading, for while such experience reports particular local tensions, much of the real experience of mobility in our own time is that of whole social groups moving into new ways of life, not only the individual rising, but society changing. This latter experience is, however, very difficult to negotiate while the institutions towards which writers and thinkers are attracted retain their limited social reference and while new groups have been relatively unsuccessful in creating their own cultural institutions. There's an obvious danger of the advantage of individual writers drawn from more varied social origins being limited or nullified by their absorption into pre-existing standard patterns or by their concentration on fighting these patterns rather than finding or helping create new patterns. So in the 60 years since the time of Williams writing, the situation has only accelerated, developing into a conception of the individual, not even as consumer so much as entrepreneur of the self under late capitalism, whose life is now solely understood through the logic of the market, which appears at the time at which I wrote the essay, and I would say today in the midst of the COVID-19 pan pandemic, less and less stable and secure than ever. Under these conditions, the challenge, as Williams once wrote, to create new meanings and to substantiate them appears more daunting than ever, with the interiorization, personalization, and individualization of everything, of the social organization as a whole. So what I argue in my chapter is that by returning to concepts like the structures of feeling, we begin to see a more complicated picture of literary culture and literary ecologies emerge in which social, political, and economic determinations have effaced the visibility of larger networks of production through which a literature as a literature or a literary ecology functions, emerges, and performs. In particular, these are literary ecologies in which the relations between lived cultures, which persist, albeit under pressure and often against great odds, still retain these deep entanglements with the selective dominant tradition that is more visible to us as quote unquote world literature or African literature or any of these sort of things. So returning to the work of Raymond Williams then offers us an approach that enables us to make visible the less visible, to nuance the static, to rethink conceptions such as the World Republic of Letters as one ec ecological model amongst many. What a return to Williams might bring to world literary studies then is an approach which accounts for the full complexity of cultural production as lived in experience, one which enables us to understand the mechanisms through which certain subsets of literature, certain selective traditions, become more highly visible by a, through their preponderance in a dominant tradition whose centers are elsewhere. 
while also allowing us to locate and identify the larger networks of relations which span wider and sometimes multiple, sometimes messier, sometimes more complex literary ecologies. So I'll stop there, thank you. That's great, excellent, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, really interesting paper again. Uh, let's move on now rapidly um, to um, Anna, Anna Kumblu, who's a, a chapter is called um, Mediation Metabolized. Um, and um, Anna is a professor of English at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where her research and teaching um, center on the novel and theory, especially formalism, Marxism, and psychoanalysis. She's the author of um, The Order of Forms, Realism, Formalism and Social Space 2019, Marxist Film Theory and Fight Club 2019, and Realising Capital 2014. And she's the founding facilitator of the V21 Collective, Victorian Studies for the 21st Century, and the Inter-Chicago Circle for Experimental um, Critical Theory. Again, thank you so much, Anna, for joining us this evening. So over to you for your, for your paper. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thanks um, to the Society for having us. Thanks also to Paul and to Maru um, and to echo the idea that this was a real luxury to get to um, uh, think with Raymond Williams for so long. Um, also want to acknowledge the medium in which we are meeting, right, and it's uh, sort of um, normalization in the context of the crisis of the pandemic, which has not left us at all. Um, it scarcely needs saying that we find ourselves in a kind of moment of churning emergency and omnicrisis, but this self-identity is a problem. We um, Williamsonians who are committed to the project of emancipatory struggle um, have to work against mass immiseration and systemic inequity at ever worsening scales. Those of us higher education workers endure the destruction of the university as venue for free inquiry the firing and exploiting of our colleagues with the pandemic as pretext and more, the financialization of our students at ever accelerating pace. And of course, we inhabitants of earth are confronting the unevenly distributed catastrophe of the ecocide and the slamming window to mitigate mass displacement and war. Contemporary cultural production contorts under the pressure of these urgencies a kind of bizarre simultaneous spectacularization and squelching by hypermediatized imagistic infoglet algorithmia. The present omnicrisis affects a broad move away from representation and toward presence, direct message, image over text, nonfiction over fiction, extremity over nuance, flatness over dimension expressivism above all else. This repudiation of mediation and contemporary cultural production swells an omnipresent vogue for immediacy. If Marxism has a ready-made way to explain immediacy as the cultural efflux of a circulation forward base, less obvious is what Marxist theory offers by way of positive counter. How do we practice crisis response while upholding that mediation is not a luxury? Raymond Williams has some tips. The social activity of representation is at the center of his life's work, which arguably amounts to a full and affirmative theory of mediation. Although unsung, Williams' theory remains the most substantive in the Marxist aesthetic tradition more thoroughly elaborated than the motifs of mediation in Hegel, Marx, Lukács, and Adorno. Throughout his career, from early work writing novels and writing about realism, to study of communications technologies and mass culture, to kind of intensifying Marxist questions, Williams articulated mediation as, quote, a necessary process, I'm sorry, necessary processes of composition in a specific medium. Keen to fathom this putting into medium as a practice of everyday life, he was constantly reformulating how much there is, quote, a need for images, for representation of what living now is like. Ordinary people ceaselessly endeavor to make sense out of their experience and to use that made sense as the basis of higher order connections to other people around them. 
to mediate then is to put into medium, which is to fabricate a representation where none is imminently given. This generative form giving, fictifying, Williams most often understood on the model of writing. And he celebrated that as the production of the meaning of, that can collectivize. Rooted always in a political project of liberation from exploitation, extraction, and alienation, mediation stands at the heart of Williams' conflicted engagement with Marxism and its conceptual intensification over the course of his career. Both of the late programmatic accounts of mediation that Williams proffers in Marxism and literature and keywords reiterate a kind of trajectory of becoming Marxist by narrating a history of the idea of mediation that culminates its Marxist inflection. As he tells it, in colloquial usage, mediation has legalistic connotations of brokering agreements between opposing interests, like husband and wife, or capital and labor. While there are, of course, more precise connotations at work in the history of philosophy, this colloquial significance is actually important for the um, Williamsonian promise of the term because it so clearly underscores relationships and their conflictuality. In classical philosophy, as exemplified in Aristotle, mediation described the action of linking the levels of a syllogism, the agent of which Aristotle referred to as a middle in distinction from an extreme. And in Latin, it similarly means intercession and having, like cutting things in half. So tracing a line from Aristotle to medieval texts to Hegel and Marx and Lukács and Adorno, Williams arrays three etymological and historical senses that entwine in his schematization. Mediation as intercession and conflict, mediation as the middling between two otherwise separate entities, parties or experiences, and mediation as the expression of the unexpressed. All three of these senses are required, Williams contends, for any coherent Marxist analysis of culture. Interceding in class conflict, generating common grounds, and making available to thought the supervalent abstractions of ideology, totality, emancipation, and utopia, mediation encompasses both sides, the mystification of capitalist antagonisms and their elucidation, both the adhesion of social relations and their dissolution in critique. Enveloping such duality, mediation becomes for Williams an active process and it relates, um, he, he kind of called it the creative agency of rendering ideas in material form. And this becomes somehow the social agency of changing our relations because we can represent them. Studying process is a recipe for infinite elaboration. And some of the legacies of cultural studies today enact this uh, infinity as a kind of micrological enumeration. And that's why it's so important that Williams anticipates that risk in the theoretical climax of his work on mediation. The essay Base and Superstructure in Marx's Cultural Theory from 1973, which is notably um, the first of his works to name a political orientation in the title, uh, leaving behind the kind of more generic titles like culture and society or communications in favor of the political and intellectual specificity of the Marxist tradition. Um, this essay takes up the central question of the Marxist cultural theory of determination, and it intervenes against unidirectional undialectical accounts. It insists on the interpenetration of the economic mode of production alongside the cultural institutions and meaning frames accruing to it. Where in his kind of previous works up to this point of this essay, um, he'd used the verb to mediate quite often. In base and superstructure, the noun mediation finally takes priority. And this conceptual substantialization should be understood as an effect of the expressly Marxist political purchase of the essay. In these pages, mediation is realized as the concept that's necessary for a non-deterministic theory of the relationship between social being and consciousness, material practices of existence, and then the ideas and representations thereof. As he goes in the essay to describe a quasi history of base superstructure notions, he passively points to what he calls an operational qualification 
in which the determination of the superstructure by the base is nuanced by, quote, delays in time, complication, and certain indirect or relatively distant relationships. And then he points to what he calls another fundamental evolution when qualification passes to reconceptualization. And these are all very passive constructions, is really important. This is a quote. The relationship itself, meaning between base and superstructure, was more substantially looked at. This was the kind of reconsideration which gave rise to the modern notion of mediation, in which something more than simple reflection or reproduction, indeed something radically different from either reflection or reproduction, actively occurs." End quote. So there's this strangely unattributed agency and activity of who or what gives rise. And that's, I think, really burying the bombshell of Williams's own advances, which are to situate mediation, not only in the base superstructure relationship, which itself would be an important contribution, right? But in the very notion of the base itself. Quote, when we talk of the base, we are talking of a process and not a state. And then he asserts that this emphasis on process must mean, quote, we are then less tempted to dismiss as superstructural and in that sense as merely secondary certain vital productive social forces, which are in the broad sense from the beginning basic. So he offers this renovation of a spatial model that reconfigures the structural foundations of determination, finding an active agential construction of the economic base via representation, via meaning institution. The essential brilliance of this essay is Williams' demand that this emphasis on process, on relationship, on mutuality, that has to be requisite for any kind of um, su uh, suitably refined Marxism or dialectical Marxism, that this emphasis nonetheless must never veer into a dispersive celebratory indeterminacy that refuses causality or totality. In a formidable and prescient riposte to our own hegemonic Latorianisms in media theory, cultural studies, and literary criticism, Williams starkly warned that the dialecticity actuated by the concept of mediation risked disappearing into the encomium of complexity, and that vigilant theorizing was necessary to avoid the risk. Recommending in the Lukacian vein totality as a more useful concept than the traditional base superstructure model, Williams concisely cautions. This is a long quote. It is very easy for the notion of totality to empty of its essential content. The key question to ask about any notion of totality in cultural theory is this, whether the notion of totality includes the notion of intention. For if totality is simply concrete, if it is simply the recognition of a large variety of miscellaneous and contemporaneous practices, then it is essentially empty of any content that could be called Marxist." End quote. So totality he offers as a more suitable spatial model than that of the Überbau, but its acumen will dissipate under the fetish of the concrete. Abstraction also has to animate the, the theory of totality. And that abstraction pertains in part to the ways that capitalist domination and determination of social existence do not always readily appear in the realm of the concrete. To analyze culture, to recognize mediation, we have to not only revel in the concrete and preach complexity, but we also have to hail what lacks immediate presence. Williams continues by unambiguously defining intention as class rule. Quote, intention, the notion of intention, restores the key question or rather the key emphasis. For while it is true that any society is a complex whole, it is also true that any society has a specific organization, a specific structure, and that the principles of this organization and structure can be seen as directly related to certain social intentions, intentions by which we define the society, which in all our experience have been the rule of a particular class." End quote. With this incisive distinction, Williams parries up front the lukewarm diffusions that dominate media and cultural studies today. The sheer fact of power's dispersal does not gainsay the other sheer fact of its concentration. 
Recognizing distributive agency too often lets the ruling class off the hook. Williams never lets his considerations of localized, concrete, processual situations becloud the intensive totality of class. There are other consolidations of the theory of mediation in his later works, which you can read about in the essay. But even with those other consolidations, the theory really remains kind of understated in Williams and still underdeveloped in our present. Maybe intrinsically, uh, the theory of mediation cannot ascend to a theory at all, since it pitches itself as the intercessional strata between theory and practice, between abstract and concrete, between making capitalist totality thinkable and pinioning the power of thought. Williams' ambivalence about fully proclaiming the importance of this fundamental motif or fully gauging his own prodigious gifts leaves mediation fittingly on middling ground. And what a contrast this poses to our current hellscape where unrelenting polarities and militant empiricisms evacuate mediation. Against the crush of immediacy, Williams commends and instantiates mediation as synthetic reflective processing. Mediations are socially enacted composites of language, compositions of meaning, composed ideas that produce something more than our immediate lived experience. Rather than perpetuating the intrinsic immersions and extremes of omnicrisis, this putting into medium and constructing of the middle actually responds. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, right. Um, any any questions for any of our uh, contributors this evening? Um, let me see the hands. Well, maybe I can ask a brief question to all of you just to kind of get things on underway while people gather their thoughts. So um, I just I just enjoyed the, all the papers so much. Um, Paul, I just I, I guess the audience might be a little intrigued as to sort of what you go on to say about the Aaron Dutty Roy novel. I mean, I, I realise that given constraints of time, you didn't sort of get there, but it, it would be great if you could just, you know, elaborate a little bit or, you know, give a sense of how um that the analysis that you offer which is derived mainly from uh, williams's um english novel book um you know illuminates um roy or you know reception of roy i think you're especially sharp on the reception of the novel um if you could say a bit about that i think that that'd be of interest to people um Madhu, i wondered if you could say a bit more about i mean you talked about the, the, the structure of feeling and the, the centrality of that category um it seems to me that williams is very interested in the idea of the structure of feeling being sort of generationally specific in some sense and i wondered whether there were the, whether, whether there were those sort of generational shifts or nuances within the different um, writers that you're that you're talking about um whether, whether that can be picked up and and i you know there's so much there but i just it seems to me that there's a sort of real intensification of williams's engagement with the concept of mediation in the 70s and partly that clearly is a response to the long overdue very belated translation of history and class consciousness in 1971 i just wondered if you could sort of reflect a little more on that sort of that sort of the, the, the sort of high theory of that moment that is clearly yeah powered by that translation and also of course uh, gramsci's prison notebooks both translated in 71 and both you know william's big base superstructure essay seems to be sort of thinking through both of them in different ways so yeah, maybe Paul first. Um, yeah, thanks. That, thanks for the question. Um, the so the Iron Daddy Roy book, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, which I just thought was great when I read it. And you're right that the the reviews. So as I kind of was writing about it, I looked at a lot of the reviews, and it was pretty remarkable. So the, the novel, if you haven't read it, it sort of begins by telling the story of a, a kind of transgendered boy who, you know, a trans woman, but actually not exactly, a, more a hijra, it's called, which is a kind of intersex identity that has a pretty clear, if if liminal, 
location in the social order, right? So the novel kind of starts you off in what seems to be in a contemporary context, a very sort of individualized kind of identity based sort of story, which it in some ways sort of is, right? But then it immediately explodes into this sort of panorama of Indian society, and in particular gets very focused on the struggle in Kashmir. And so the critics of the novel all basically complain that it's not really a novel. I mean, there are a few people who really like it, but the things that people complain about are really striking. They, they, there are too many characters. Because there are too many characters, it doesn't develop any of them in, in sort of, you know, concrete terms. All of the assumptions, in other words, of political liberalism that are also the assumptions of a certain theory of the novel are on display in these critiques of the book for being didactic, you know, for knowing the right side of history. And so my, my immediate interest in that was that that just seemed so wrong about the novel. I mean, the novel, for instance, spends like 100 pages in the mind of a torturer, you know, who Arundhati Roy clearly doesn't like, right? But as also humanizes through a kind of interiorized narrative. I mean, in other words, it's nothing if not a complicated depiction of a range of social types, even if at the same time, you know where she stands, right? And the other thing I thought was interesting about it, and readers of The God of Small Things will, will sort of recognize the structure, is that at the heart of the Kashmir story is also a love story, right? And so these are the two links to me between what Williams is up to and what Roy is up to. So the first is that individual stories are also communal stories, right? Um, and this is actually, I think, something that, you know, threads through everything that we're sort of saying, right? Um, I mean, one of the things you noted, Madhu, about these um, uh, uh, global African novels is that they tend to be individualized and affective, right? When you're also interested in reducing them to the kind of communal experience that you had in these literary, um, you know, uh, literary festivals uh, in, in, that you've been to, right? Um, and the whole theory of mediation is effectively a way of connecting what seem like individualized experiences to larger totalities. And so then the second thing was that despite that, the sort of human cost of the problems that she's outlining is always kind of center stage in the novel, right? And so that's the place where it would be easy to see it as kind of overly sentimental. And I actually think it does a better job managing that than The God of Small Things did, you know, however long ago that book was written, right? There's a pretty long gap between the two novels. And, um, and yet, you know, taking that let's say sentimental love story also seriously, which, you know, I just, I maybe I'm being sentimental myself, but I love the part where William says like, it, there has to still be something human or else it doesn't make any sense to describe it as alienated. That's just like a very powerful comment to me about the thing in the name of which you were sort of fighting, right? Um, uh, and so, so yeah, so I really saw, I really thought Williams helped, helped me sort of think through what that novel was doing on those on those two registers. I guess I should go next. Um, and I think it's a really good good question, right? Because it's absolutely true what you've said then. Like it is generational. And I think it's not just generational. I mean, I think when we think about structures of feeling, the way that Williams articulates them is very much in terms of history and generation and time period. But my interest in my chapter was thinking about what if we take these same concepts and kind of try to apply them to geography and to space. And I think the same things do it here and they do apply because what we're really trying to do is think about excavating the feeling of being there, right? Because as critics, when we work with text, we can see what's in the text, we can see there, we can try to recreate it, but it's never the same as the feeling of actually being there. And that was the kind of central question I was trying to think about in my chapter is, you know, why is this object of study that I have been studying for most of my adult life, but I have a whole career about, not reflective of the things that I feel? Why is it different from the actual experience of being there? What's missing? Why are the conversations so circular? I mean, so this is another thing where I think Williams becomes really relevant is, at least in world literary studies, I think there is this kind of like Nietzschean eternal recurrence of the same, where it's the same argument and it just sort of recycles time and time again. And it has been doing for, you know, like half a century now. And I think part of it is 
our inability to grasp the structure of feeling that distinguishes the past from the present, here from there, and all these sorts of questions. So the thing I was trying to think about with, with my chapter and the thing I think is really valuable, and it's actually something I think really central to towards 2000, is thinking about how some questions and some concepts some dispositions and some aesthetics that were once in their time radical become assimilated into a kind of dominant hierarchy that effaces difference and effaces the radical and becomes highly conservative. But we don't perceive that because we don't have the structure of feeling. We don't have that full wholeness and understanding um, and how we recuperate that, I think, is actually incredibly difficult. But I think William does point us in a lot of right direction. And so, for example, for me, as a world literary scholar, you know, particularly in my field as a materialist African literary critic, the most fashionable kind of theory is like Bourdieu, Bourdieu and following Bourdieu, right, where it's all thinking about the field of cultural production. But as we know from, you know, for example, critics like Sarah Briette, the central problem with Bourdieu is that he treats culture as a homology. So he sees it as autonomous and as separate from the larger social organization. He never thinks about the socio-political and economic fields which subtend the cultural. And I think what Williams lets us do is actually think about the social organization and social formation as a whole. And it's enormously complex. It's extremely difficult to think about all these moving pieces. But I think that's the only way we can have an actual kind of robust scholarship where we move beyond these kinds of like normative wisdom, kind of uninteresting binaries and cyclical repetitive questions. Yes, great. Please raise your hands, everyone else, if you have any, have, have, have any, have any questions, please do. Anna, did you want to pick up on, on, on my question? Uh, yeah, no, I really appreciate that question so much. And it's obviously like such an important way of um, telling uh, the story of William's incredible scope is to think about the actual social circles that he's trafficking in and then the, you know, um, literary and intellectual culture and had the different move among institutions and stuff. Um, and I guess I would just sort of say in a um, maybe too conceptual and not enough, not sufficiently biographical sense that you know, this kind of idea of the um, headiness of the theory moment and the also um, geopolitical um, kind of instability and complexity of the early 70s, um, I think sort of put forward, you know, the theory as its own mediation, right? It sort of makes very um, uh, palpable in that moment the work that concepts do. And so when Williams is sort of like on this lifelong trajectory of looking for like an answer to determinism, right? Or sort of reconciling um, that he thinks that Marxist abstraction like overlooks the agency of everyday meaning making, right? I think that this um, high theory moment as it were is really committed to the notion that ideas actually matter, that representations actually matter, that abstractions can be capacitating, not just oppressive, right? Um, and that there is like a, a thickening of um, the, everyday sense making into concepts that then can indeed capacitate emancipatory uh, movement, right? So um, I, I would just sort of put that as like in the energy there that his, his willingness to sort of become more intellectually Marxist. Yeah, I think you could certainly um, source to the, the really um, vibrant practice of theory and what people thought was its potential in that moment. Yeah. Any other questions? Can I ask a question to Paul and to Anna? Is that allowed? Am yeah, I allowed? Of course. Please do. It's great. It's something I've been thinking about throughout this conversation. I've really enjoyed hearing your papers. I really appreciated your questions, Ben. But it's something with Williams, and I'm saying this in a very self indulgent way. So I'm coming to you from my home in Bristol, in the United Kingdom. Bristol, as you might know, is the gateway into the West Country. We're about 40 minutes from South Wales. And I'm wondering, how much do you think Williams's own sense of place as a Welshman has informed his theoretical concepts and conceptualizations, especially like the ideas that you were talking about in your own papers, because it's something that just kept coming into my head? I mean, I can say, you know, so one of the things that I read uh, from this um, book was the Who Speaks for Wales book. Um, and, you know, I regularly teach culture is ordinary in my introduction to English studies class. And I, I do it in part because the students I teach are many of them are first generation college students and working class students. And so, 
you know, I, I teach them this essay so that they can sort of reflect on where they're going and where they've been. And, you know, it works sometimes. I mean, sometimes they just don't know what to make of it. Um, but I was so struck um, in reading the, the Wales book about how much of what in, in, in culture is ordinary is a generalized process of like individual response to larger sort of, you know, inherited cultural traditions gets sort of re-described very clearly um, as, as the distinction between, you know, a Welsh identity and, and, and a UK identity. But then even further about the inherited forms of Welsh identity and the particular kind of Welsh identity, right? So, you know, th this, is, this is why I think Williams you know, so one aspect of Williams, it seems to me, right, is the resistance to theorizing out of some of that stuff that I quoted about the system, right? But the other reason he can be difficult, actually, is because he is so invested in process and in that constant back and forth belief between lived experience and idea, right? So in other words, why I say all that is that it's really striking that what you your first pass is to think that it's like Wales versus the UK, but it's actually as much like my individualized experience as both Welsh and part of this thing, the United Kingdom against reified versions of each as they determine and yet don't capture my own personal experience. So anyway, I sort of retroactively saw all of that at play in this much earlier essay, which, you know, it is about class and it is about moving from Wales to Cambridge. Uh, but it doesn't really say that in the same way that the later stuff does. And so that for me sort of opened up how maybe the, a lifelong awareness of that gap between everyday experience and like received identity might have started from that experience. I think that's a super good answer. I probably don't have a whole lot to add to that, except that that beautiful kind of oscillatory process of contextualization that Paul is talking about, I think really does guide a lot of William's arguments everywhere, right? That it's like, you know, the positionality of like, okay, vis-a-vis -vis Cambridge or, or Oxford or so on, like I'm a Welshman, but you know, in the kind of um, uh, global order of urbanization that he's writing about so much, he, you know, belongs to the, uh, the imperial center, right? And so the, um, uh, yeah, I just think that there, there's a lot of sensitivity, but it's like an agility. It's like situatedness isn't stuckness for him maybe, or, you know, you have to sort of just keep sort of dialectically moving back to like, but from which perspective is this, actually, you know, not, you know, with the terrain of being a Welshman shift. Yeah. Yeah, we did receive a rather dispiriting email from a, a guy who bought Williams's family home in Pandy and uh, was um, offering it as an Airbnb at a reduced rate to society members. Um, yeah, we, we suggested that he might at least uh, make a contribution to the society, you know, as a percentage of every, every, every letter that he managed to secure. But yeah, it was a yeah depressing uh, moment for us, I, I must say. Um, Mardo, I wondered if you could say a bit more about something that I was really interested in about in your essay, but I didn't know about it, which is the idea of scale jumping, which is some, something you're kind of drawing, you, you're drawing it, uh, this term from geography. But how does that how does that manifest itself in terms of the sort of narrative strategies of the novels that you're describing, I wonder? Yeah, so it's a, it's a term that um, has been sort of popularized by the human geographer, the Marxist human geographer, it should be say it said, Neil Smith, right? So scale jumping, right? So when we think about space, we inhabit space at different scales. So we can think about, for example, the scale of our bodies, the scale of our homes, the scale of our towns, the scale of our cities, the scale of our regions, our nations, international, et cetera, et cetera. So Neil Smith has written some very interesting stuff about scale jumping. And in his conceptualization, scale jumping is often something that's quite radical that is used by activists to kind of gain audience and to sort of gain purchase into things. So for example, we might be sort of subject to, let's say in our homes, um, an unfair hegemonic regime, right? Like let's say there's something in the family and we might then appeal to a state authority to protect us and take us out of that situation. Like that's an example of scale jumping, right? It's a sort of movement where we, where we remove ourselves from the scale we're in and we jump up a few levels, right? And what I found really interesting about looking at a lot of contemporary world literature, particularly African novels, is they inhabit scale jumping, but in a very, very, very different way. 
So for example, you'll have a novel that's extremely um, preoccupied with the family and the majority of the novel will take place within let's say an overcrowded apartment in Harlem or something like that, right? With like an immigrant, like I'm thinking here about The Hold the Dreamer by Mbolo Mbue. But then suddenly it'll just shift and suddenly you're in the airport in Douala and suddenly you're in this totally different place. And it's actually not an appeal for activist power. It's not an appeal to circumvent the, the circuits of power and oppression that sort of organize our lives in these hierarchies. In these particular novels, it's actually used as a shortcut towards anything like resolution. So one of the things I've seen in a lot of the contemporary world literature novels I've read, and again, particularly the African novel, because that's my own specialism, is quite often scale jumping is used as a way to avoid plot resolution. So you might have like a domestic drama and it suddenly ends with somebody getting on an airplane to go to America. Or, you know, you might have um, a novel like Homegoing, which is a sort of bifurcating multi-generational family saga that follows a family that was fractured through enslavement. And it suddenly just ends with both people in the sea swimming outside of Accra. And so I think like for me, what's quite interesting is this idea of a tactic that human geography has been always seeing as like a kind of like circumventing of spatiality or spatial strategies, a kind of tactical way of kind of undergirding the kind of representations of space that are meant to delineate the possibilities of our life has been transformed under neoliberalism and these new novels into a way to avoid closure, into a way to avoid resolution. And I find that really fascinating. So I think that's the thing that I really meant. And I think, again, it's interesting reading Williams because his, like all of his work is about the connectedness. So to think about how do we analyze, how do we analyze disjuncture through a kind of critical framework that's about connectedness. And I think we end up with some very interesting kind of ways of thinking about it in that way. I have a question oh. for all of that, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, please do, please do. I just, I'm so, it's so striking to hear you, you know, want to think of Williams as like a lost theorist of the novel or an unacknowledged theorist of the novel, because I think he's often, um, you know, they're sort of so attentive to medium, but that like maybe not so attentive to genre or like, you know, that literature sort of looms or writing looms for him uh, in a bigger way than the sort of modal distinctions within it. Um, you know, I guess the melodrama maybe is an exception to that, but I just wondered if you could um, say a little bit about, um, you know, where you see the place of like genre as opposed to uh, medium in his um, thought. Yeah, that's a good, it's a good question. And I hadn't thought a lot about the distinction there in terms of genre versus medium. And I suppose I would have to go more towards the sci-fi stuff, which I don't really know that well, honestly. Um, but what I've been, what, what I, where I'm, where I'm sort of most located was in reading and teaching the English novel book and just thinking about how he produces and you know pieces bits and pieces of that are in the country and city and you know it's it's like it has this that that book has this and it comes from his lectures and so that has a way of like crystallizing something as a theory of a particular genre or a particular mode let's call the novel right a form that had been sort of there in the country and the city but you know next to country house poems and next to you know more let's say um uh, non-fictional or sort of discursive texts um and, and when it just lines all of that up um and then is so focused on this question of community which i think in all of our talks really and in all of the stuff williams writes is so central to him anyway and i just think of like when i so I've been teaching this theory of the novel course basically um, for the last several years. And it's just so striking how distinct that book is from so much of what is sort of canonically in that theory of the novel. Um, you know, like when you go to anthologies or when you go to the things that you would sort of typically teach or when you go through the sort of classics from Wad to Armstrong to McKeon or what, whatever it is, right? Um, it, it's just such a sort of striking emphasis and an emphasis, you know, and this is just repeating something I've said earlier, um, and in a way I fear I'm not exactly answering your question, but an emphasis on this, this, this refusal to see sociality as only the realm of ideological inscription, right? Which reveals that kind of liberal freedom basis of the way so many people think about this relationship 
whether it's in and, and in the novel form in particular, and it's precisely that stuff that everyone took Roy to task for, for instance, right? It's like if you show individuals tied to their social order, then they're no longer individuals, which means they're no longer free, right? which means it's not modern or something. And there's such a set of assumptions that line up, right? Once you, um, and that, that then can be shifted once you think of, you know, community in terms of something more than just unfreedom, right? I don't know, that's not really an answer to your question, but that's what I was interested in in that. No, yeah, but like if I can add a little bit to it, I mean, this is why it's one of the reasons why I'm really like interested in why so few people who work on post D or anti colonial thought actually engage with Williams. And I do get it, like I get it because he doesn't actually talk about those things directly, but it's the method for me. Yeah. That is really the thing where like, yeah, this is exactly our method. This idea of totalities, not having these hermetically sealed modes of knowledge production, not having these kinds of like preordained ideas that for me has been really generative and interesting about Williams's work. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly how I was thinking of it. Is there any more questions? Um, it doesn't look like there are. Um, yeah, Phil's saying that there's a recording of tonight events on YouTube uh, soon, uh, alongside the other two events. Um, so I think you need to do three things. You need to buy the book, which is there's 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 a there's, a, there's an offer on tonight, so you can you can get the, you can get the book cheaper. Um, you need yeah, there it is. Yeah, um, splendid. Yeah, um, you need to join the Raymond Williams Society if you're not already members, and you need to come to Manchester in the spring um, if you can. It'd be lovely to welcome as many of you as possible. But thank you so much to uh, Madhu, Anna, and Paul for you know three really you know excellent papers and. Um, the book is, you know, really excellent. So um, I, I, I urge you to acquire it somehow. Um, so thank you very much, um, everybody. And good night. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great seeing Bye. you guys. Thank you.